the next speaker is uh, Lisa Feigenson, and she uh, talks on constraints and flexibility in early quantification. Yeah, oh, nice. uh, actually, I'm afraid my title is a little bit misleading because I submitted that title to Sarah before I revised what I was going to be talking about. So it will be relevant to quantification, but not directly about that topic, but I'm happy to talk about it. Um, so I just have to start by thanking Johan and Sarah for including me in this terrific group. Um, I feel like I've been learning a great deal already from all of you. Um, so a number of your talks so far have taken this approach of thinking about you know, what are the core mechanics of cognition in different domains, number and language and music, and do these stem from sort of common core mechanisms or um, reflect uh, constraints of the system more generally. So I thought I would try to follow in those footsteps today and do that in my talk and kind of tell you about my research and gesture rather than making a claim at a possible parallel uh, between my work on object representations and uh, some of the issues about recursion we've been, we've been talking about. And so this will definitely leave me out of my depths, but you can, you can correct me as we go. Um, so the common theme I want to talk about is, is hierarchical representation. And so we, when we reflect on the fundamental nature of cognition, we think, kind of have this intuition that um, representing things hierarchically um, captures something core about our, our thought processes, like thinking about primitives and then abstracting over them, binding them um, into some kind of uh, higher order unit. Um, and so that's what I want to talk about today. I'll be telling you about some of the work my lab's been doing on um, object representations. And the claim I will be making, is just very simple, is that humans tend to represent the world in terms of objects. Uh, we can think about those objects atomically, but we can also bind them in hierarchical fashion, which has benefits for uh, the way we organize working memory, uh, memory more generally. Um, and uh, uh, that this tendency to think about things in hi hierarchical fashion is true throughout the lifespan. So all the data I tell you about today will be coming from babies, but I think it's just reflective of human cognition generally. And then I'm hoping that uh, the data I tell you about inspire us to think about um, something that I don't know that much about because I'm not at all a language person, but maybe we can talk about whether these computations I'll try to show you in kids um, have anything to do with the unbounded merge operation that, that we've been talking about that's come up uh, over and over again. Okay, so again, my understanding of this isn't deep, but in the sort of first half level, my understanding is, the claim is that uh, merge takes some syntactic primitives um, and can combine these into a set. And we can look at some of the other properties of this operation. So uh, if it's unbounded, the output of a merge operation can then be input to another merge operation. And on some views of this, uh, this is binary. So there can only be uh, two primitives combined in this way. And we can talk more about that too. Um, and then also that um, sometimes a merge operation creates uh, a set with a label so that, for example, drink water um, tells us something about uh, uh, drinking. Um, so there's this labeling. <coughs> and so I just want to talk about uh, babies uh, computations over object representations and to suggest that at least for the first four of these, we'll see some parallels. And basically that if you just replace objects for syntactic objects that we've been talking about, um, we might get a pretty good alignment. And I don't know whether that's useful to think about um, or not, but it's at least a conversation starter. Okay, so the starting point for, um, for my talk is just the um, simple observation that uh, adults and infants live in an extremely complex visual world, and that raises a lot of different problems. One problem that's faced by this infant or by all of us is that it's totally unclear from opening our eyes and looking at the world, what are the units? So is this baby supposed to uh, represent um, subparts of objects, little stems on apples, individual objects, reach a common color? So where are the units in this scene is one problem. Uh, the second problem is just that clearly there's much too much information in front of you right now or in this market scene if you're a baby to be able to uh, attend and store and memory for further computation at any one time. There's just too much uh, to get in there. So that's the starting problem. Um, and so we have the evidence, uh, the field has evidence from adults that bear on both of these problems. Um, so this is just, this is an example of the type of experiment that bears on these problems. This is a famous one from Luck and Vogel. Um, it's several years old by now, and many of you probably know this uh, change detection experiment where adults 
see very quick flashes of you know, this and then this, and they have to just say whether anything has changed in this very simple scene. Um, so this live segment has gone from broken to solid, and so they're supposed to say yes, there's a change. So um, when you do this kind of study with adults, you find very systematically that we're all excellent, uh, pretty much perfect at detecting changes whenever the scene has one or two or three or maybe four objects, we always see the change. We have all the objects at once. But whenever we go to four and five and six and seven and eight objects, performance plummets precipitously. So um, this is also true regardless of how many features you load up on the objects, right? So there may be three objects here, but they all have lots of features. They can be long or short, red or green, broken or not, horizontal or vertical. And so two things about these studies. One is that what controls performance is the number of objects, not the number of features, which tells us that objects are a relevant unit for adults. And number two, there's a limit on how many objects are stored over, computed over, compared over, in this case, in working memory at any one time. Okay, so there's many, many studies uh, like this. Um, well, what about babies? So let's stretch back earlier in the life span. We know from lots of research um, that object is also uh, an extremely relevant unit uh, to babies as well. Um, from research like Liz's beautiful work and many other people, this is one kind of bit of evidence. So babies, can, of course, can track objects over occlusion. So if you see one object plus another one, like Karen Glim shows five month olds, babies are surprised or look longer when uh, that reveals just one thing. That seems to be something special about object representations because when you replace the solid coherent objects with something non-objecty like pours of rice or pours of water and you show the exact same sequence, right? I pour a pile of rice, I pour another pile of rice. Now it turns out that even though these two events are totally parallel, babies couldn't care less what's revealed here. You can have nothing here and babies are fine with that. So they're, not, they're tracking objects, they're not tracking non-objects. And that starts to align babies' abilities with those are adults telling us that Look, throughout the lifespan, objects are important. Um, and so it, uh, in my lab, we also wanted to address that second question about the limits of processing this stuff in working memory. So adults are limited to processing three or four. What about babies? And this is a task that uh, Susan um, talked about yesterday, so I won't belabor it. It's just a cracker task. I can show you in a video. This baby is seeing uh, uh, experimenter put two crackers sequentially into one bucket and one into it. You can see the baby's actually looking at every individual placement, looks back in the center, and then pendant measure is a one-shot choice. So the baby isn't allowed to learn anything and there's one data point per baby. Typical of baby experiments, very sparse data. But by piling up lots of different babies and lots of different comparisons, we can get meaningful data like this. Susan also showed this graph, so it's very simple. At all the ages that we've tested babies, so starting when they're mobile, um, babies succeed whenever the number of crackers in either location is below three. So one versus two, they choose two. Two versus three, they choose three. Three versus four, over here, they're at chance, and that doesn't seem to be about the discriminability of your ratio because you pull those ratios apart and they still fail. Even if you pull them apart monumentally, one, two, three, four crackers and one cracker, half the babies go to one cracker. There's no system there. And I won't spend time telling you about the controls, but there's lots of different controls we do in this task to ask about whether it's really uh, object-based, this kind of limit. Um, there's other kinds of innovations we do to ask what are the actual computations babies are, are doing? Are they caring about discrete objects or amount of stuff? And we can talk about that if you want, but I won't spend time on that. What I will do is just say um, that that kind of strict limit on object-based performance isn't something funny about foraging. So that's a foraging task. It's not something about choosing between two quantities. Um, it's not even something about the sequential loading up of working memory. So we have this very same signature across lots of different tasks. And here's another task. In this task, they see objects simultaneously. All the objects are then hidden in a, in a box, and we measure babies searching uh, the box. So for example, you can put two toys in a box, allow babies to pull out one and secretly remove the other and ask for the baby's persistent searching for the missing object. If so, it tells us that they've successfully maintained a representation of two things, right? Compared to if they've had one in and one's gone out and you shouldn't search anymore. So this is the kind of parametric manipulation we can do uh, just to ask about whether we get these same memory signatures under very different circumstances. So just because I'm gonna be using this task um, for the next many slides, 
I'll tell you a little about it in a little more detail. This is what happens on a trial. The baby sees this box and it has a, a spandex covered opening so they can reach inside but they can't see what's in the box. So you put the box there, you show the babies one object, to draw their attention to it, and they watch you hide it inside. The baby's then allowed to reach in and pull that object out and you say, great job, you take the box away, and then you measure what babies do. And it turns out that babies search a little bit here because, you know, it's fun to search in a box, there's nothing else to do, the experiment is not talking to them, so we get uh, uh, some number of seconds of searching. But critically, we want to compare that to what happens in this case when you hide, say, two objects in the box at the same time, the baby pulls out one, again, this is where the experimenter surreptitiously, sneakily removes the other from the back of the box, we then measure the baby's search for that missing toy. Uh, after 10 seconds, the experimenter helps the baby, oh, is this what you were looking for? And now at that point, two things have gone in, two things have come out, and we again take a measurement uh, baseline, you know, what a baby can do. And so this baseline is very similar to the one in, one out baseline, um, uh, which is what I've plotted there. But importantly, both of these baseline uh, uh, scores are much uh, shorter in duration. Babies search very little compared to when there should be. There's positive evidence uh, that there's something else in the box. So all of the data I'm going to show you in the next figure are plotted as a subtraction of this box expected to be full minus box empty, average box empty different scores. OK, so um, just the way, same way we plotted the cracker data, this is baby's success and failure with when remembering uh, when we give them different Reloads. So this is two in and one out. We get a successful searching for the missing object. Three in and two out, you get success. Three in and one out, you get success. It doesn't matter how you arrange the three. Uh, uh, you can do it in all different kinds of ways. Two out, you again get success. But most importantly, just like in the cracker task, when you see four objects and they're all visible at one time, they all go in the box at one time, when you put up any subset of them, four go in, three come out, two come out, one come out, maybe you just sit there. There's absolutely nothing else left in the box. So this is the kind of same kind of utter failure that we saw in uh, the previous case, suggesting that uh, like adults, um, infants are limited at this time scale um, here in remembering uh, three-dimensional solid objects. Well, it just we just replicated that that uh, under slightly different circumstances. So just take it as the same thing. It's a robust finding. Um, okay, so um, back to the example of the baby in the visually crowded marketplace. These kinds of data um, from my lab and other labs suggest that um, when you actually probe what's being stored in an infant's working memory or an adult's working memory at any one time slice, there's actually little there. There's something like uh, object representation A, object representation B, object representation C. At least that's one way that a baby can store information from this complex. Uh, see. So, right, we have this <laughs> limit in adults. We also see this limit um, in babies. It's kind of surprising to adults. It doesn't feel right under normal circumstances that we're so very limited in what we can store in memory. Right? When you tell subjects that uh, they deny that it's true, it's a surprising finding. I think one of the reasons why this finding is surprising, one of the reasons we don't feel the force of this strict memory limitation is that as adults, we have some mechanisms for circumventing it. And one of these mechanisms has been around and studied for a long time, and that's chunking representations of individuals uh, into chunks or sets. And we do this without even thinking about it uh, on a daily basis. So for example, uh, we tell each other our, our phone numbers in this kind of chunked way, either separating written numerals um, with spaces to group them into uh, units of three or four, or inserting pauses in our speech again to group them into three or four, same with credit card numbers or passport numbers or what have you. So we can use space and time to chunk um, individual uh, numbers or letters into, into larger groups. We can also do it based on uh, semantic information stored in long-term memory, and this is the classic example that's taught you know, to undergraduates when we talk about chunking. So it may be hard to store nine unrelated letters in memory, but once you recognize that there are three familiar uh, acronyms, it becomes very easy. And nine, uh, the problem of remembering nine items becomes the problem of representing uh, three three-letter acronyms. Um, so adults can do this, and we do it all the time. Uh, and so we wanted to ask the developmental question: Where does this come from? 
it certainly could be a kind of strategy that's taught to kids and kids work to acquire. In fact, we know that sometimes this is a strategy that teachers try to employ when teaching kids, but it might also just be a fundamental part of the cognitive architecture. So we ask this by going back to the babies, and these are 12 and 14 month old uh, kids, back to the babies in this reaching into the box task, right? in which we found that whenever we present four or more objects, <coughs> babies always fail to remember how many there are. Right? So pull out any subset and they just sit there and the box is empty. And it, that finding obtains whenever all four objects are in a, a single location. So it could be four objects you know, in a square on top of the box, it could be four objects in a line on top of the box. It doesn't matter, we see failure and failure and failure. But we wanted to ask whether, like in the case with phone numbers, we could give babies sort of spatio-temporal cues to help them uh, parse or chunk this array, to help them find representations of individual objects, objects of A, objects of B, sub B, into sets. And so we did a very simple manipulation. This is with Justin Alberta. The box is in the middle. Now the objects, rather than all being in one location, just are presented on two different side platforms. So we say, hey, look at this. The two objects in one hand movement. Hey, look at this. They all go in the box. And then babies are allowed to pull out a subset. Here I'm going to be showing you the data from four go in and two come out. When four go in and two come out, for the first time across lots of different kinds of methodologies, we now see uh, success. And that's also true with four go in and three come out. Um, we ask, we've asked a lot of different things. One example is, um, are these sets, if that's what babies are representing, are these sets tracked individually? So can you track these uh, locations if the sets wind up in different places? So you can replace these platforms that push babies to, to conceiving of this as a set. You can replace that with actual two boxes. So here there's a set of two and it goes in this box, and a set of two and it goes in this box. Now, if you pull out to here, you better only search over here for the missing ones. You only get credit for searching here. Whereas in this case, there's two and there's two. Those are good chunking cues, but now they all wind up in the same location. So are you representing folks to the location that you set? And the answer is yes. So when we give kids these spatial and temporal uh, chunking cues, they seem to be overcoming this limit that we see robustly across tasks and across uh, ages. Uh, and again, I made the analogy to the phone number case. Can babies, so this is where we're, we're exogenously pushing the babies, giving them really good grouping information. We next wanted to ask whether babies could do something more like the, the FBI example. Not exactly like it, um, but something more like it that is using knowledge about objects um, to, to break things up in this way. And so we replaced the four identical uh, ping pong balls with um, actual object kinds. In one case, there were objects that 14-month-old babies are reported by their parents to be familiar with. Many of them know the names for cats and cars, the two identical cats, two identical cars. And in another condition, they were um, perceptually groupable, but parents reported that their children did not know what uh, cooked shrimp were and these funny little tank objects, but they're clearly parsable on a perceptual basis. Um, and we crossed that manipulation of sort of semantic familiarity with a, a more perceptual cue about interleaving objects. So we made, this is a little harder than this, right? Because adjacent objects, uh, identical objects are not adjacent. So we spatially interleave them, or make them spatially adjacent, and the same thing with the, with the shrimps and the tanks. And we asked whether babies could represent uh, all four objects. In this case, remember, against the backdrop of repeated failures time and time again, um, when they don't have these cues. So we might find that babies always succeed when we give them known kinds. That is, babies can use knowledge about kinds, cat kinds, and, and uh, car kinds, or animals and vehicles to break this up into sets. Um, babies could always succeed when we give them identical objects spatially adjacent. That perceptual parsing is just really easy in that case. Or we could find some kind of um, mix of these two. And so here's what we did find. Um, across these different conditions. So these are the, the blue ones are the different scores uh, that I've been showing you before. You can kind of ignore these. These are the well off searching scores. But um, in the case of the cats and the cars, these 14 month old babies succeeded. So two cats and two cars go in. They get out one cat and one car, and they successfully persist in searching for the missing objects. That suggests set finding, chunking. Um, they do that even when these things aren't uh, uh, directly adjacent. Interestingly, they don't have to have familiarity with these kinds to succeed.
succeed. They succeed with um, shrimps and tanks, at least when they're next to each other, but apparently not when they're spatially intervened. They can't mentally reach down and reorganize those things without having some kind of long-term basis of, of semantic knowledge there. So this suggests both an effect of perceptual grouping and of, of conceptual grouping, I would suggest. Um, <clears throat> Right, so this is like getting an, uh, an unordered list of letters and then mentally reorganizing them into something meaningful. That's what I would suggest the success uh, indicates. Now, if the basis of Fabi's set by their grouping is really something like object kinds, then they should be able to bind together, abstract across two tokens of the same uh, type. Right, so they don't have to have identical objects. These are both cats, even though one is standing up in orange and furry and one is lying down in black and smooth. And Cars, etc. Um, but we would predict that um, you can give babies lots of perceptual variability, and there's no fun, no clear way in which to parse these into any smaller subgroups. They're just cat and a cat and a cat and a cat. We should see failure, and um, and that's exactly what we see. You succeed with two tokens from two types, but fail with four tokens from one type. Now, I think that's getting closer to suggesting, like I've been trying to claim, that that babies are using semantic knowledge as a basis for set binding. Um, but you could quibble with that, of course, because these two objects are definitely more perceptually similar than these two objects. So it could be that maybe you accept, maybe you accept the, uh, the argument of set finding, but not of, of con object concepts, which kinds of being the basis for that. Um, and I agree that's a tricky problem. Um, we get a little bit closer to that in this condition, which we again went back to showing babies um, the four identical ping pong balls. Remember, they always fail with this. But we made these perceptually identical objects conceptually distinct. We tried to through the act of labeling, and it was in a communicative context. We looked at the babies and we said, look, a dax, a dax, a flick it, a flick it. They all in the box. They pull out two objects. We don't label them. And we see whether they keep searching. Or we said, look at this, look at this, look at that, look at that. And we get success when we give them the conceptual labels and failure when we give them the this and the that. So again, I don't think this totally nails that conception perception part, but, but um, you know, that's, that's the progress that we've made towards that question. Um, so, so far, I've wanted to make the claim that babies, like adults, can represent the world in terms of individual objects. When you give them too many to objects to represent in memory at one time, babies can use space and time to chunk things into sets, to, 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 to bind them, um, and then they can use different sources of information um, to do this. Adults, of course, can also do this, but can do this with fancier, more sophisticated kinds of uh, capacities. So for example, adults can bind not just two individual representations into a set, but three, as in the CIA, FBI, KGB example. So that's a little bit fancier. Um, I think fancier than that is that adults can create much more complex mental hierarchies, much more complex branching structures, where you have sets and subsets and so on. So for example, here's nine letters, and here's nine letters, and they're all hard to represent, and you can chunk them, C, I, F, B, I, K, G, B, but if you, you can chunk these, but if you recognize that you know, these three refer to government agencies, and those three refer to broadcasting companies, you've created a third level of representation where you have a super chunk, a chunk, and then you have to be able, of course, to really set binding, to unpack the chunk into individual items. So we wanted to push babies and ask uh, about these two abilities. One is just, what are the parametric limits on binding, right? How many sets, how many items within a set? And two, how, how branching, how complex can these uh, mental organizations be? So um, the first question, uh, the parametrics, um, we just messed around uh, back again with identical ping pong balls um, with different numbers of objects. So we presented babies with a single set of six, all objects on top of the box. That should no doubt be very hard for babies and we expected failure. We took the same six objects in other conditions. A lot of these are within child, so you see the same child succeeding or failing depending on how you present the objects. Um, anyway, so the same child would see three sets of two, two and two and two. They all six go in, and in all of these cases, they pull out four, and the dependent measure is do you keep searching when six go in and four come out? And last, two sets of three. And no surprise, we found failure with six. That's beyond working memory capacity for babies and for adults. We found success with three sets of two. And surprisingly, to me at least, we found failure with uh, two sets of three. OK, so this starts to suggest um, um, some of the limits 
um, at least it doesn't seem that at this age, under these conditions, 14-month-old babies can buy three individual um, object representations into a group, but they can do at least three sets of two. Um, and, and how many sets can they do, and can they embed sets within sets? Um, that's the, the next question we asked. So um, in these cases, in this experiment, we gave babies, I'm calling this two sets of two sets of two. So if you splice the box, if you splice the scene down the middle, there's the left and right. That's a first parse. Each left and right contains two sets, right? There's the set of, there's the set of cats and the set of cars, and each one of those contains two object representations. So we're kind of combining spatial and uh, perceptual, conceptual information in this condition. Here, it's, um, it's really all spatial. There's left and right side of the box. On the left side of the box, there's two platforms. You see the one's black and one's white, just to distinguish them. White, and each platform contains two objects. And what we found is that in both of those cases, this is eight objects, so way beyond baby's working memory capacity, when all of these eight objects go in and four come out, babies successfully continue searching for their missing objects. So this seems like uh, they're going well beyond working memory capacity. However, of course, one uh, clear argument is that maybe you're presenting babies with so many objects that you're triggering the activation of some other system, like an analog magnitude system, and babies are forgetting about individuals at all and just running a representation of, eh, about eightness. Oh, about fourness, I should keep reaching. Okay? So uh, we did this manipulation, which I like because it's almost exactly this, only we just move these little platforms to a single row in front of the box. Right? So instead of being left and right, they're all spaced in front of the box. But it's still four platforms and two. And we found that babies failed. So it doesn't seem to be approximate number of representations. Right? It seems to be embedded sets, that is, sets uh, of sets. So the claim is that um, babies can parse this into the first parse is left and right side of the box. The second parse could be based on space in the platform case or based on property of kind uh, in the cats and cars case, but they still have access to the individual object representations that are contained within these sets. So uh, I think of this as three uh, uh, levels of representation in babies. Um, okay, so, so far trying to align babies' object representations with those of adults in terms of the fundamental uh, limit on the number of individuals, and in terms of this binding computation, um, question mark, merge computation, uh, where, where babies and adults can use spatial temporal information, they can use conceptual information, they can use linguistic information to sort of infer that there are hidden properties or essences of hidden kind when they don't yet know what they are, um, and that they can nest chunks within um, um, larger chunks. So, I last want to turn to just quickly a set of two, of, of two more experiments. Um, I don't know how I'm doing on time. But I'm, okay, great. So one question is whether um, the 14 month olds in whom we've demonstrated all these abilities, they are no longer really pre-linguistic, right? So they have access to, to language. They are producing some words, many of them. They're certainly comprehending a lot of words. And so one question is whether these um, set embedding abilities are dependent on language, and there's multiple ways one can go about looking at that. When you turn to a totally different species, which might be a great approach um, within our lab, we just turn to looking at younger kids. And so these are seven month olds. With seven month olds, we asked whether they could also, uh, what are the limits of working memory, and can you go beyond that by doing this chunking? But we had to use a different method because seven month olds aren't very reliable at reaching for discrete objects in a box. So we instead uh, turn to their looking, their spontaneous looking behavior. So the seven month olds are sitting in front of a puppet stage, and in this first experiment, we're just uh, sort of delineating the limits of their working memory ability. In that very first slide, or second slide with the elephant, I showed you that, right, one plus one, babies can contract that as two as early as five months or younger, um, but we, that leaves open the question of whether they can do better than two, can they do three, in this very simple passive task. So the baby sees a screen, sees the experimenter place an object, and an identical object, and an identical object. It's just like the elephants, only it's three things. And we then measure they're looking to the unexpected outcome, one plus one plus one is two, versus the expected outcome, one plus one plus one um, is three. And we find that relative to their baseline looking, babies do not show any significant change in their preference. They don't care whether they're looking at two or three. 
Um, and we replicated that a couple of times. It suggests, and it actually is coincident with other kinds of methods that suggest that working memory capacity doesn't asymptote until about 10 or 12 months of age. So these seven month olds can store stuff in working memory with fewer individual items. So that's one thing. And the second thing is, can you push them to do better than that? Um, we tried giving them spatiotemporal cues like we did with the ping pong balls in the box. Here we just separated the screens and we sometimes we outline them in different colors to make them even more distinctive, but it's still three identical objects, right? Object, object, and then behind here, another object. So you could represent that as a chunk of two and a chunk of one. Um, and these are the unexpected and expected outcome. And again, we see failure. So this is developmental change, right? Unlike the 14-month-olds who do really well at this in an arguably harder task, the seven-month-olds show no hint of success. What about using perceptual information? So now we go back to a single hiding location, but we give them cues. And these aren't great depictions of the objects. These are um, squeaky balls, and this is a, a, a block with a schematic face. So it's kind of like a pseudo-animate and, and non-animate. Um, and they can even make different sounds. But we all hide them all sequentially in the same location. So this is kind of like cat, cat, car, car, ball, ball, block. Um, so can babies represent that as a chunk of two and a chunk of one? Um, so the outcomes and the answer is no. So again, these seven of olds are, are showing uh, poorer performance than the 14s. So is it the case that these kids just don't have access to this set binding computation? Um, well, then we decided to, to try and give babies redundant cues. So instead of pulling these apart, giving them only space or only uh, semantic information or, or properties, we doubled them up and gave babies, right, these are two object A and object A hidden in this location, and object B hidden in a very distinctive separate location. And now we found uh, that babies succeed. So whenever we give them redundant cues, we've tried different sorts of cues, they need more evidence, but they seem to still be behaving like the 14-month-olds. They can still do the chunking. They can still overcome their working memory limit. Uh, um, OK, the last real quick set of experiments I want to tell you about just addresses the question about whether this is really chunking. And so far, I've just been trying to convince you that babies have this ability by appealing to overcoming working memory limits. But you know, ideally, you'd like to see other kinds of signatures of set binding. And so this is kind of a first step at a different kind of signature of set binding. And we have other thoughts as well, but I'll, I'll see what you think about this one. Um, so now we're going to go to 11 month olds. 11 month olds, a little bit older than, than, than seven. Actually, 11 month olds. Um, um, seem to have the same working memory capacity as 14. They seem to be able to represent three uh, hidden objects. Um, so remember, sevens fail here with three hidden objects behind two locations. Um, we try this basically the same thing with, with 11s, and we see that they succeed. So they look longer when one and one and one reveal uh, uh, just two. Okay. So there's no evidence of, it's not clear here whether they're, they're chunking or not, but they can remember these three identical objects, right? Um, one way to ask whether they're, they're chunking is to see what, whether anything happens to the representation, the, the, the representation I'm claiming is being chunked. Does it, does it change in its sort of rigidity or your ability to update it in any way? Okay. So here, we have these two locations and we hide all the objects sequentially. So all the objects hidden behind this screen will get hidden at one time before they wait you have to move over here. So it's object, object. Now move your attention over here, object. Okay. So we did show babies almost the same thing, but just change the order. So they have to go from set to set. So it's still three objects, it's still two screens, but it's object, object, object. The question here is, can you add to or change a set representation, here perhaps a set of one, after you've kind of closed it off or bracketed it and moved on to another location? Okay, so it's the same, seems like it should be the same task. Um, it's just object, object, object. And now we find, actually, in, in several experiments, that babies uh, fail. They fail when you do this in this task. They fail when you do it in the cracker task, too. Cracker, cracker, cracker. Babies choose randomly. OK, so is that because it's hard to switch attention and switch gaze between lots of locations? We did another really simple manipulation to get at this. We tried to make these two locations separated in space. We think that that's what's uh, pushing babies to conceive of these as two sets. We just connected them with a thin strip of foam core, as is done in uh, lots of object tracking experiments in, in adults. We made two things into one dumbbell. Okay? They still then see a uh, thing hidden over here, thing hidden over here, thing hidden over here, but they're behind one location rather than two. So one is a strip of foam core connecting them. 
um, and now we see that they succeed. Okay, so we think that this is starting to tell us something about uh, uh, what happens to the representations once they've been chunked. They lose some, they sacrifice something in their flexibility. We're also starting to ask whether they sacrifice um, in their representational precision, that is whether you can represent things as accurately, say the color or shape, as accurately in a chunk representation as in a non-chunk representation. And I, I won't take the time to tell you about those studies um, now. We'll just go back to this slide and suggest that in addition to representing object A, object B, object C, babies can represent things like uh, at least uh, if there's a set of two bound persons, a set of two apples, a set of two melons, something like this. Kind of representation is accessible uh, from very early in life. Okay, so now back to this kind of speculation, and this is where I'm uh, totally speculating. Um, right, so you take object primitives, so we have that, right? Babies can represent an object and an object. They seem, I've argued, that they can combine these uh, into a set. Okay. Also similar to kind of mer unbounded merge function, you can then right, bind things into another set and take those as input and bind those into a superset. Okay, so that's one of the properties of merge. Oh, that's going to serve uh, as input to doing a computation again. And then maybe it sort of looks like these representations, this, this, this function is binary in kids. And that at least so far, we don't have any evidence that babies can chunk three things together. So, you know, those are just some, some gestures and hand waving at potential parallels across these kinds of signatures that we see in uh, uh, merge functions and other kinds of domains. Whether those are the same or not, how, you know, how useful is this parallel? I don't know, maybe you can talk about that. Um, but I think what's safe to say is that you see this same kind of hierarchical representation um, across lots of different domains. So with that, I want to thank my lab, the students who, who uh, did all this work, and thank you for your attention.